Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars now for a year and a half. If there's any guests you'd like to see, please pop me an email at wendy at wendymurdoch.com, and we'll reach out to them. We don't always get a response from the suggestions that we get, but we do keep trying. So if there's somebody that you'd really like to see, just let us know. Today, my guest is Sarah Hunt, and she's returning for tips and tricks on boot fitting, which I am so excited about because I am now struggling with figuring out what boots to get for my horse and and the tips and tricks for fitting hopefully is the, what's going to help me here um and so i'm not home right now so it doesn't matter he's out in the field but i'm ready to get home and try and figure this out so welcome sarah thank you so much for joining me today thank you for having me again it's really nice to be able to have a uh, way to share all of this knowledge i've gained with more people than just the people that i can reach locally where i can drive so yeah, it's great awesome. to be able to, to share so for those who might not know you, can you just give us a little bit of your background? So um, somebody who's watching the webinar who didn't- Yeah, for sure. So I got into this whole barefoot thing in 2005 or six, somewhere in there. Um, and then in 2006, uh, when I was first suggested that it was I retire my mare, she was 18 at the time, um, I felt that that was a foolish thing to do. And so I pulled her shoes. And uh, three months later, we were back to work and camping and doing all of our fun things. So that's when I kind of realized that maybe there's something to this. You know, it's not just a, well, my horse is going to be retired anyway, so I'll try it. It's a, you know, wow, this gave me more than my horse back. And so over the next year or so, we transitioned all of our horses and had really tremendous luck. And so I kind of went from there. Um, you know, I spent kind of a lot of time in the interim trimming my own horses a couple of friends horses helping some folks with boots because i had a huge collection because it you know there's a lot of trial and error with this and um then in 2017 or 18 um you know someone mentioned to me maybe i should charge people for doing all of that <laughs> um and in 2018 i you know i decided hey i'm just gonna do this and make it my business. And now I'm pretty much a full-time trimmer and boot fitter. And I represent um, several different brands and I will work with just about anything. So even though I don't necessarily represent, you know, um, Renegade or a few others, I do happily work with those boots. So it just well, I love the fact that you're not aligned with any one particular boot. Cause as we know, no one size fits all. Exactly. And I have plenty of horses who are in, you know, gloves in front and scoots behind. It's just, you have to fit the foot that's right in front of you. And, you know, so when we pull the shoes, we might do, you know, something like a cavallo. And then when they're fit and they're working, then we can take them and do a scoop. And because they have often, you know, different needs and different reasons need different boots. You know, it's the same thing. You have different shoes to go to the gym than you do to go hiking. They have different purposes and, you know, yes, you could go to the gym in your hiking boots, but you'd be in, impeded by them. And you could go hiking in your gym shoes, but you'd have some issues too. And so, you know, figuring out the right boot for the situation is really important. Um, and that's why my, I, I immediately was, no, I can't only represent one boot company, you know, even though Easy Care has over a dozen different models, because they're all just different. So the only way we can do it right is by making sure that we have a broad spectrum of being able to do everything. Yeah. So if you're coming in and watching this webinar and haven't watched the first one, please go back and watch Sarah. I forgot what number it was. Your webinar on on. Yeah, it was the end of May, May 27th. If that helps date wise. Uh, actually, I might just go out and um, find it and I can put it in the chat. I'll pop it up in the chat so everybody knows what the webinar is to go back and watch. I do have it posted in my, uh, and a link to it posted in my, uh, my Facebook business page as well. Yeah, um, and you can always go to my channel and then search for someone's name. So if you're really uh, trying to find a specific one. So Sarah Hunt's number 212, and this is 224. There you go, 212. Okay, so um, so we're not going to go into all of the ins and outs of boots themselves because we did that in the last one. We're going to talk about tips and tricks today in terms of fitting and using boots. Is that right? Great. My little keynote here. Are we seeing that? Not yet. Yeah, yeah I got a screen share. Yeah, I made you co-host for sure. Oh, hang on. I always forget that part. Yep. Uh, share screen. There we go. OK, 
Okay. Are we good? Yeah, we're good. This is awesome. Okay. So yeah, um, we've got our hoof boot tips and tricks and we will, I have my little about me in here too. Um, so kind of a few more details if you're curious. I also have more stuff on my website, of course, spectrumequine.com. Um, but mostly, you know, anything helpful here besides my, my chestnut mare's really delightful face in that photo is, um, you know, I've been doing boots and I've done boots as a performance horse rider with dressage horses and with trail and endurance and it, 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 a whole bunch of things. So, you know, having that variety of experience is also helpful, I think. Um, so folks ask me a lot, you know, well, but can you do this in hoof boots? And can you do this in hoof boots? And um, pretty much always that question is yes, with possibly the one exception of raining. Um, although I do know there's some, been some folks that have tried to figure out how to put slide plates onto a hoof boot. Oh. Um, so, but with that exception, um, I'm pretty sure you can do just about anything in hoof boots. Um, obviously different governing bodies for horse shows have their own persnickety rules. Um, and in which case you could just do a glue on shell. Um, but for the most part, hoof boots, you, yes, you can do anything in hoof boots, provided you get one that fits well. Um, I know folks who do their cross country runs three day eventing in scoot boots with studs. Um, obviously, you know, actually the sig a significantly large number of horses finishing the Tevis, especially in the top 10, have been doing them year after year as of late in boots or glue ons, not uh, in shoes. Um, Easy Care has records of that. Um, I think a lot of them are finishing Tevis in uh, glove glue ons. Um, and that's one of the toughest endurance rides in the world. So pretty much we've proven, yes, you can do just about anything in hoof boots. And now. of course, I would think that the thing that's the most critical, especially in performance horses, is that they really have to fit correctly. Yes. So that's when choosing your boot, which was the subject of last uh, webinar, is really important. And then obviously, even if you choose the perfect boot, sometimes you will still have a little issue here and there because horses' feet change. Um, and that's more details that I'll be going into here in, in this particular webinar. So first up, just some general, this applies to any boot suggestions. Um, some are made left and right. Uh, like this is a Kowalo Sport here, which as you can see, it's different. Oh yeah. Side to side. Um, so the Kowalo Sports and Simples are designed to be with the fastener on the outside so that the horse can't smack the fastener with the other foot. Um, and then you've got other boots like gloves, which this is a glove. They come individually. They're all the same. So it's a good idea to keep your lefts and rights, lefts and rights, um, because uh, the boot will stretch and wear. Um, and I don't have a worn boot to show you, unfortunately, but you can, if you, if you go and look at boots that have been decently used, you will see, you know, of course, no horse moves per per perfectly straight. There's always going to be break over a little of the outside, usually, um, sometimes a little of the inside, things like that. And so as the boot breaks into that particular horse, it's going to help influence their own movements and help them perform exactly how they break a boot in. So it's always good to do a left and right. Um, and especially in these performance boots, like a glove, which um, are more particular on fit, if you can try and keep them more specific. Um, if you know that you're gonna need to use one pair of boots on multiple horses, then going with something like a Kabbalah where it doesn't matter nearly so much is generally a, a, um, a good idea. It's gonna improve your performance of your boot. Um, really good way to mark your boots left and right. Uh, you can do nail polish. Obviously, then that comes right back off. Um, I also do know some folks who they'll take like um, a nippers or a hole punch and put you know like a mark on the outside of the boot. Um, I have had clients ask me to use a Dremel and make a little L, you know, in one of the boots on the soles. Um, definitely options there. 
Um, just make sure putting it somewhere that it's not just going to get smacked by the foot and come off again. You know, putting your nice little nail polish, it looks pretty right in the middle. And then you'll get back from your ride and you won't be able to tell it's there because it wears right off. Um, Sharpie, silver Sharpies work sometimes, um, depending on the boot model um, and the type of plastic that's been used in making the boot. Um, some of it kind of just sinks in and disappears and some of it stays put. So, um, but nail polish is pretty reliable and removable, which is nice. Um, some bootstraps can be reversed. So the loose end points towards the outside. That's the case with Renegades. Um, several of Easy Care's models like the Backcountry and Trail where they have a strap in the back. Um, you can sort of do it with scoots, not with the front straps, but you can do it with which side you unfasten your pastern strap. So if you are the only person using the boot and you know that you will only ever unfasten the outside, then you can do it that way. Um, so that's definitely a good option. If it's something like a Renegade where um, you have those straps that do stick out and they often kind of have a flappy end, I would recommend making sure that they that both point outwards and tuck them into the keepers, which second note there. Um, because obviously, you know, if you're going through some deep sand or mud or rocks or whatever, eventually the strap will pull up and up, up and up and up, and then it'll come undone and then your boot comes off. So keepers are, are, are definitely uh, a good thing if you have them on your model. I'm a little fussy about keepers in general. If I see a bridal, I'll go and- Yes, yes, you have to do all the little keepers and make them all neat. Yes, you do, it's tidy. <laughs> Um, and how to avoid many problems, uh, keep them clean. The number of times that I you know, will go and to work on somebody's boots or they'll, or we'll exchange a pair or whatever, and I get them back and they clearly have like never been cleaned ever. And this is in San Diego where for the most part, it's just like dust and dirt, and sand. It's not gross mud. Um, it's well, no wonder your boot is failing because there's so much dirt in all of your parts that you know the screws are just can't deal with it anymore and they're just popping free or stuff like that. Um, so keeping them clean, you know, it might just be just you know take a stiff brush and brush them off real quick. It might be stick them in a bucket. Might be you know depending on the kind of terrain you're doing, but um, just keep them clean. That's going to really extend the life of your boots. Is there anything you should not clean them with? Um, the different manufacturers have different care guides. Okay. Um, you know, some of them like the Kowalos have leather parts so you can clean with leather cleaner, but don't clean them with something that'll damage leather. Um, you know, a lot of them are just like, just use water and gentle detergent. I find that a lot of stuff that you can use that's Fairly, you know, it's safe to get on your hands and skin and stuff like that. It's probably fine to get on the boots. Um, okay, that's a good rule of thumb. If you're willing to put your hand in it, you can put your boot. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, a few times I've had, you know, a horse with scratches or whatever, and I get a boot and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to clean this thing with some old sand or some betadine. You know, make sure that we get all of the bacteria out of there. And, you know, it, are you going to soak it in there for six hours? Maybe not. But, um, you know, the, the materials that these boots are made out of are, they're meant to be, you know, beat up by horse feet. So right. to some extent, they have to be fairly durable. Um, so number two is store indoors out of the sun. UV light is extremely damaging to everything, including plastics and neoprene. Um, I have had folks try to exchange boots, you know, that they've had stashed in their, in their, cross ties somewhere that have been in a bucket for a year. And it's like, um, can't take that one. I literally hold it and pink, it falls apart. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, UV light just is, it, it's extremely destructive. So keep them inside. Um, and UV you light is just sunlight, right? We're just gonna yeah. Yeah. yeah, so keep them inside. If for some reason you have to store them outside, then, you know, get in a, like an outdoor storage box or something like that. Um, to keep your stuff in, which is always nice. I'm sure your barn appreciate having all your things in a nice little bin, um, most do. But um, UV light will trash things quickly. So that's also my number one. Um, you know, keep them clean, keep them out of the sun. That's gonna put you ahead of the game in durability. Uh, many boots have replaceable parts, the gaiters, straps, clips, yada, yada. Um, very often, 
for many models, the only time you really need to replace the whole thing is when you've worn a hole in the toe and you're just completely like, okay, this boot is shot. Um, for scoot boots, the front straps are replaceable. They actually come with replacement front and pastern straps. Um, so once you've worn a hole, you know, through the actual sole, yes, you need a new boot. Um, for gloves, the gaiters are replaceable. No problem there. Um, this Cavallo model does not have any replaceable parts. This is the sport. Um, the simple, the little Velcro straps on the side are replaceable. The same thing with the entry level boot, the big foot boot, the cute little boot. Um, yeah, all of those straps are all replaceable. Um, so it's just the sport here that does not have any replaceable parts that I know of, at least looking at it. Um, well, and wearing out, that's going to depend on your surface, how much you the use. Amount you use them, the kind of terrain you do, you know, are you riding on nice, you know, nice dirt or are you scrambling through, you know, rock and limestone? I mean, it really does make a difference. Uh, folks ask me a lot, how long will they last? I'm like, well, how much do you ride? <laughs> how long will your tires last? 40,000 miles. Well, how long is that? How many miles a year do you drive? Right. And it, it, is it highway miles or is it going off roading? It's, it's really things are, that's a question that I can only give general ballparks, but right. um, they will last you longer than a pair of shoes will. That I can tell you, unless maybe if you're doing crazy endurance rides, in which case probably it's about the same. Or maybe a little so, so just as an example, those horses doing the Tevis, they did not wear out their boots on the Tevis, did they? Um, my guess is those the, the glue ons that they put on right before, they're probably pretty beat. I don't know how much longer they would really make it, um, but that is a hundred miles of the toughest stuff that there really is. Yeah, the terrain out there is crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's nuts. <laughs> it's nuts. But you know, there is a lot of tread in a glove. Hopefully, we can sort of see with the. Oh okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you can see that little line there. Yep. That's your sole level. So all of this is trend. Oh, it's just like a car tire. You got your wear bars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so and you can see from the side as well. Yeah. And then you got your built in brake over there. Yep. But um, there's a lot of tread on the glove. I think they're probably, and because they're a softer rubber, they don't wear quite as quick. So I think the gloves may last the longest in terms of abusing the tread. Okay. Um, in my experience, although Renegades, well, they've got good tread on them, but they're a little bit of stiffer plastic. And so they can wear a little bit faster. The Cavallos wear out kind of fast in my experience in comparison with the same horse wearing, you know, putting them in one and then the other. Um, but then we're back to fit in terms of what's going to work best on your horse. Exactly. Exactly. So it, it doesn't matter if it's wearing out faster or less if you can't keep them on and you're losing them. Right. <laughs> to be really practical about it. Um, anywho, so replaceable parts. Um, re the Renegades are really awesome in that if you wear a hole in the toe of a Renegade, you can just order a new shell and reuse your captivator and strap. Hmm. So you can actually order from them. You can even order one that's already got the cable pre-laced so you don't have to do all the cable work yourself. You can just um, unscrew the captivator, put the new cable in, screw it back together, and then adjust. So, um, but that's the only boot that has quite that design, I think. Now, I don't have experience with every kind of boot on the market because if I did, I would have my entire garage full of boots more so than it already is. But, <laughs> Um, no, there's more the boots coming out every day, right? Exactly, exactly. So of the boots that are commonly available that I deal with on a regular basis, um, you know, which is my experience that I can speak from, uh, Renegades are the ones that you can really do that with, which is nice because, you know, replacement parts do add up, you know, I mean, are, are a replacement glove gator is 37, I think. The whole boot is 75, sometimes less depending where you buy it from, but um, you know, so close to half the boot is the gator, but you know, the other half is the shell. It's you have two parts basically. Okay, can we do some quick, easy math? Like, what's the average cost of French shoes, metal shoes? That's so dependent across the country where you ask. Right, but where are you? Um, San Diego. Yeah. 
Not, actually, I don't know because I haven't had my horses shot but in so long. Everybody that I, listening, just type in what an average pair of, uh, what you pay for a pair of French shoes. Because I think once we do the math, the fact that you can like rip 150 bucks. Okay, and a pair of boots is gonna cost. So for me, on my pricing, um, a pair of gloves is 150. Um, the Cavallos range from like 140 for the ELBs for a pair to 200 for a pair of Trex, I think, somewhere in that ballpark. Right around the 180 to 200 mark is a fairly consistent spot for um a lot of boots so scoots are 200 uh Kavalo treks are somewhere in there uh renegades are about 200 equine fusions are 210 to 225 um so you're you're kind of right in that spot some of them are a little bit less um the gloves because there's just not a whole lot to them um are less expensive um but other than that once you get a boot that's got more parts and pieces and that kind of thing then obviously the price goes up a little bit but somewhere in that 200 spot. So usually the math comes out to you start saving money on the second or third trim versus yeah. shoes. Yeah, because you still have to pay for the trim, but. Um, yeah, so it's 50 bucks for your trim. And, yeah. you know, so it's 250 your first go for your yeah. boots and, and trim. And so then. One person's boots has lasted six to eight months and she was putting on shoes at 150 bucks a pop every six weeks. Yeah, yeah. At six yeah. to eight months, I mean, you must be doing a lot of work. To go through them in six to eight months. Uh, yep, six to eight months. Yeah, because I've I've got boots, you know, going for a couple of years. Easy. I mean, it, it just depends how much you use them. If you use them once a week for your trail ride, then they're going to last a long time. So, I mean, the bottom line is they're cost effective. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. You know, and um, even the more expensive setups when you need, you know, the more expensive boots or the therapy boots or da 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 da. I mean, some of these folks that I, I help when I get them transitioned out, I had a gal whose horse was in you know, handmade front shoes and it was costing her close to 450 bucks a pop. And the horse was also completely lame, not helpful. Um, you know, and so I came out and, you know, yes, the first couple of cycles were expensive because you were casting him to give him the support because his feet were so distorted we couldn't get him in boots of any kind. Um, and, um, you know, so it was however much, you know, 150, 175 for the first couple of cycles. And then we put him in gloves and now it's, you know, so, okay, 150 for a pair of gloves. And now he is sound enough that he literally drags her around. She's having to go back to like retraining him how to behave himself at 20 something because <laughs> he is now sound enough to work. Um, and we, you know, trim him every five weeks and he's a happy guy. You know, so it, it catches up really quick in terms of what things cost and pay for. Yep. Um, so on avoiding problems, checking your screws. Um, so a lot of boots have some, they either have stitching or screws, usually both. Um, and obviously very easy to come home and realize you lost a boot is because one of your screws came loose and you lost the gator and off you go. Uh, so ch check on them every so often, um, kind of part of your regular maintenance. Um, if you have one that just won't stay put, um, sometimes like for a while, easy care and scoop boot were shipping their boots with Loctite in the screws mm -hmm. and that's great until you need to replace a part. Mm. And then you end up having to like drill out the screw in order to get it out. And you end up destroying the boot, trying to get the screws out because they're Loctite in it. Um, so I don't often recommend Loctite. And if you do decide to use it, make sure you use the stuff that's not heat activated. Oh, okay. Yeah, because there's two kinds of Loctite. There's the blue and the red, and I think it's the red that is heat activated. And that stuff is, it, you might as well just like, you know, weld it together. Um, so I recommend nail polish, frankly, because then if you need to get them undone, you can, but they're not just gonna wiggle their own way loose. So, um, if you know that you're going to probably need to replace part, you know, don't lock it in so tight that you, you absolutely can't. Right. Um, and certain models, new or maintenance and others, um, if you've got, you know, little teeny holes that need to be kept free, uh, like such as on the, uh, the Renegades or the cable system so that it can move smoothly and not catch and wear, uh, then that's got to be kept clean. So you need to keep, keep those really clean. Uh, certain models like scoots and gloves, it's, it's, there's not a whole lot of moving parts to keep clean. So 
Um, different models have different maintenance issues. So looking here at some common boot accessories, um, gaiters, various straps, pads, and shims. Um, so the uh, two funny looking strappy bits we have here, those both are Easy Boot Fury accessories. So um, they replace the back of the boot here, the strap with that uh, different neoprene padding. And then you can also change the front strap if you're having uh, security issues with that wide space. Okay. So just examples of some of the more strange options. Um, and then those are the endurance gaiters, which I've got one here and I will show you in a little bit when we get to that part. Those are scoop boot endurance gaiters. Um, Easy Care made a gaiter that was very similar. I have not been able to get them for a while, so I don't know if they keep if they're still making them. They were technically for the BOA boot, which is a discontinued model. Um, but the design's really nice because it works with like almost every boot model. So I use it a lot for various needs, not just in scoop boots. So items for your general boot stuff kit. Um, Mole foam or EVA foam tape. So that's that roll of tape over on the side is the EVA foam. Um, Scoop Boot sells that. Uh, you can also sometimes get it at your hardware store. The mole foam is another option. You can get that at the drugstore or on Amazon. What is mole foam? So similar to like mole skin for blisters, but oh, it's a okay. thin foam. Yeah. And very thin. This is like, you know, an eighth, maybe a quarter of an inch. If that is, this is, this is very thin stuff. It's just enough to help snug things in a little bit. Oh, God. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. And we'll get into actually the use of it, but these are some items that are good to have in your, in your boot kit. Um, athletic tape, such as Mueller tape. Um, the, they, they changed the Mueller tape a little while ago, um, and the new stuff is not as good as the old stuff, unfortunately. Um, so, so a few of us have switched to using scary sticky goat tape, which is that stuff. And that's really about. its name? Yes, that is literally the name, the Scary Sticky Goat Tape. Um, it's actually for use, it was developed for CrossFit for, I, I think, um, handling weights and stuff like that. Um, but why it works, and this is the same way that uh, the old Mueller tape worked really well, is that as it gets warm, you put a few layers around the foot, and then as it heats up from the heat of the foot, the adhesive kind of seeps through it all and oh. sticks to the boot. And so if you have a boot that likes to shift around a little bit, that can really just stick it really nicely onto the hoof wall. Um, so we also use it- Taking away any, any movement of the Yeah, boot. yeah. Uh, so you've got one that, you know, it, or, or especially if your boot works, you know, and I, I, I use it with, with, with the gloves mostly. Um, if, you're, if your gloves work fine for light riding, and then, you know, if you're gonna go out on, on a hard, fast trail ride and do a lot of cantering and scrabbling up rocks and stuff, and they'll twist, put some tape on. That can solve the problem. Um, we also use that with casting too, which is nice. Um, put the uh, the tape on the foot and then cast over it, and that sticks pretty well. It's a lot less work than using glue. Um, but that's a side side tangent. Um, duct tape, of course, because when do you not need duct tape? Um, gold bond or baby powder. Um, gold bond powder is nice because it is antifungal. You don't need any of the special ones; just the regular gold bond or the Target brand gold, you know, off brand is fine. Um, ointment, of course, never a bad idea. Uh, cotton balls or some gauze squares. So those are mainly for if you start getting rubs um, and I'll go into that a little bit. Um, any accessory straps, replacement screws, things like that for what you've got for your boots. Uh, screwdrivers and other tools you might need for repairs. Um, and on the cleaning aspect, a scrub brush. And then what I like to call it anti-funk spray. Um, so, a mix of apple cider vinegar and water is good. So that's normally useful if you've got a boot that um, encompasses more of the foot. And if you're using it for long periods of time, like in turnout, um, or you know, sometimes you've been using it every day for a while and the boot is just getting kind of gross, it's a, a nice quick spray to help with the, the thrush issues. And you can put it on your foot on the horse's feet as well. So someone's asking apple cider vinegar instead of white vinegar? Yeah, so a lot of the cheap apple cider vinegar is actually just repurposed white vinegar. 
Um, so if you actually read the writing on like the gallon size jugs, it's, oh, white vinegar and coloring. This is all cool. Um, so, you know, but if you're purely going for disinfecting, you know, the white vinegar is fine. The apple cider vinegar, I like using on their feet because the, um, especially if you get some with the mother in it, the, the natural um, probiotics and bacteria in there, it helps with helping to, to rebalance the pH of the foot and fight um, thrush and yeasts and that kind of thing. So if you've got a, a fungal issue going on already, then it, it's, it's really a nice thing to have around. And it's inexpensive, you know, just pick, you know, daily pick out the feet like you would, brush them, out, brush them off, spray, you know, and just do a good spray in there. And that will help manage light thrush issues. Um, if you have a significant thrush problem, then we need to go to something else. But, um, you know, especially if you've got a horse who's good during the summer, but gets a little funky during the winter, just add it to your regular maintenance routine and it helps quite a bit. So on to our common boot problems. These are the ones when I show up, I get questions about. Um, heel bulb and pastern rubs are kind of the number one um, problems. And in each of these, I have a slide on, so we'll go into that. Okay. Um, twisting, uh, very often too, the, you know, a little bit of twist can happen. And if, as long as you're not having other problems, not necessarily a deal breaker, um, very often the boot will twist back. So, okay. Um, this especially can happen on the gated horses are horrible. <laughs> For, <laughs> they move in such a way and they very often have torque to how they get their foot off the ground. And there's only so much you can do. Um, so we work with it, you know. Um, but twisting and then coming off, obviously, is a, is a fit problem. Um, not fitting for a whole cycle. Uh, that often can be a boot choice versus trim cycle length issue. Uh, easy boot gloves, you need a four to five week schedule. You cannot make them fit outside of that unless you are willing to do some work in between, which is very easy to learn how to do, and your farrier should be happy to show you. Um, but, you know, if you are only going to do a six or week or longer cycle, then you need to look at something other than a bump. Um, drainage doesn't show up a whole lot as an issue for me. Um, probably a good half of the boot models have adequate drainage, um, but we can't address that if it's a problem. Ooh, excuse me. And then sand buildup um, or other debris getting into the boot itself. So this little picture on the right, I'm going to go into more as to what is going on with that boot and this little smiley face. Um, but uh, you can see this, this uh, little Mustang gelding here uh, goes really nicely in all four scoop and all four uh, gloves. And that's an example of a good fit. So there's really two types of rubbing that I get into. Um, and one is just during break-in. You know, the hair gets mussed up. You might get an area where the hair is kind of thinned out or, you know, maybe even rubbed to just, there's only skin, but the skin is not really all that irritating. So there's a definite line between, okay, that's kind of a break in rub, you know, be careful, keep an eye on it, make sure it doesn't get any worse. Maybe use your boots for less length of time. You know, if you went on an hour ride and that, and that happened, then go out, only take them out for half an hour at a time until you break, until they've broken in just like you would do if you got a new pair of hiking boots, you know, don't go on a, on a six hour crazy hike the first day you wear them, break them in first. Um, so slight rub marks, but no real major injuries often resolve if you're cautious and you make sure not to let things get out of hand. This is when I really get into trouble with people because they decide that wearing the boots is more important and then this is the problem. If the skin is damaged, okay, it's, it's oozing, if you're getting a sore, if it's getting really red and tender and inflamed, if the horse reacts when you press on it or, you know, it starts bleeding, stop, don't use the boot, it doesn't fit. Um, and in any case, you can't use anything there, period, whatsoever, you know, not bell boots, not anything until the rug heals. Um, if you've got a horse who needs a therapy boot, then get casts or glue on to put on. Don't try and fight through a bleeding, oozing sore. It's, you can't heal it if something's still rubbing it. Um, in all, I, I, 
I have only had possibly one situation in which we had to just figure out some way around it and, and, and still boot over it. Um, and, you know, as soon as we could stop, we did. Um, there are other solutions. Yes, they're more expensive, but your horse's comfort is your number one priority as the horse's owner. You need to do what's right by your horse. Um, so very often the issue with rubbing um, that is a rub that precludes the use of the boot, it's a size, shape, or design mismatch between the boot and your foot. So oops, sometimes it's fixable, you know, okay, the toe has gotten a little bit long and so it's putting too much pressure against the heel of the boot. And so if you just roll the toe back, hey, now you have a little more room in there, problem solved. Um, but particularly when you've got really distorted feet, it can be really hard to find a boot that works because if you get it, you know, long enough, then it's way too wide and it's going to twist. Um, or if you've got a flare problem through the quarters, then, you know, it's going to be too long and you're going to break over problems and they're going to trip over them. And sometimes you need to fix distortions before you go to the whole boot fitting solution. Um, and that's going to preclude what boot choices you have. You know, if you are a rider who needs a performance boot, but your horse's feet are really distorted, you might have to suck it up and deal with it and fix the feet before you get into a boot that really works. Um, and that's not what people want to hear, but if they've allowed their horse's feet to get that problematic, then sometimes you have to fix things before you can get what you want, unfortunately. Um, and that might not be a popular thing to hear, but unfortunately, again, like I said, it is your job as your horse's owner to do the right thing by your horse. And I'm sorry if that ruins your show plans for this weekend, but tough. So with the, the break in rubbing, has anybody ever tried to make, you know how um, if a rider's getting rubbed, sometimes they can wear stockings under their britches and because mm -hmm. of the skin, they yes. don't get rubbed. And we, we have... Okay. Slide on that. I'm ahead yes. of myself. We're okay. getting to all of this. So basically we're doing the, the lead into the, so what, if you have these problems, what can you do? Um, so anyway, ideally you will find a boot that is the correct shape, size, and design, and your rubbing will not occur, or you'll get a little bit of that, you know, hair rubbed off, but not actually a, a problem. And then that will go away as the boot breaks in. So ideally, that's a situation that happens and everybody's happy, but sometimes that's not the case. So to help ease your break-in, uh, use them for short periods of time for a while. Um, you know, in the round pen, in the arena, on short, flat rides, um, you know, don't take them out for long periods of time immediately. Um, monitor your heel bulbs and pasterns closely. As your boot breaks in and the, you know, the skin kind of toughens up and, and, the, and the boot softens in the right areas, a well-fitting boot just, it, it, it won't rub. That's, you know, people are always asking me, but what if, but what if, I'm like, if it fits, it won't. It's like your own hiking boots, you know? Um, and it's not because your boot is too big or too small. It could be, you know, it, it's not only the boots that are too big rub or too small rub. It can be either. So rubs can be from friction because the boot is too big or from pressure because the boot is too small. Both of them are possibilities. So if you have, you know, if you get a pair of boots, you, know, you, you order them online and they're rubbing, don't just exchange them for a smaller size. That might not be the problem. Um, baby powder or gold bond powder can be helpful if moisture is a problem. Sometimes, you know, if you're doing turnout in your boots or whatever, and they're out in grass or something like that, and the feet get wet and they kind of get that soft issue going on, um, powder can help. Um, it can also help uh, with friction sometimes. Uh, so neoprene gaiters like the Scoot Boot Endurance Gaiter, which is this guy, and I will put it in a boot here and show you how it actually functions, um, can be used with many boot designs, not just Scoot Boots. Tube socks are another option, particularly for horses needing extensive boot wear, like in turnout and, th and in therapy boots. Um, so you can get a tube sock, put it on, and then I always recommend duct taping the bottom around the foot so it doesn't slide up. Right. Um, if the boot is slightly too big, slightly, like you're in between sizes slightly, um, pads or shims may take up that extra space. So that's when that uh, mole foam or EVA tape works well. If the boot is slightly too small, 
such as at the end of your trim cycle, you're starting to have problems with it, but it fit right after a trim, um, then rolling your hoof well can work well. Um, so that again, that's something that your farrier or trimmer should be perfectly willing to show you. Um, and if they're not, then I would be a little concerned because if they're in working in your horse's best interest and you are trying to work in your horse's best interests, then you're on the same team. So why will not they show you? It's not, you're not going to do that much damage with a rasp. You're just not. Um, or consider a shorter trim cycle. If you're on a six, seven, even eight week cycle, you know, very often going shorter, a lot of problems start to go away. So again, twisting and twisting can lead to rubbing. Obviously if the boot twists, it's now putting pressure on a different spot that it shouldn't be. Um, usually it's a boot that is too loose or too wide. Twisting hind boots is a common problem. It's due to the spade shape of a healthy hind foot. Um, especially, you know, we'll have boots that fit well, but then when you're going up a hill and they're digging in with those hind toes to climb a hill, the boot can twist. Um, so you can do a little tape shim at 10 o'clock and two o'clock. So on either side of the toe, basically, uh, you can use a slim model. If that boot comes in a slim and you're using a regular, you can heat fit the toe area. We're going to go into that. Um, and you can just put a, if you find that, you know, you need a different model on fronts and hinds. That's totally fine. You do not have to use the same boot all around. Um, so if it's a minor issue, you can, you can resolve it with side shims. Front shimming should be done thoughtfully because it will extend the breakover of your boot. So um, by breakover, if this is your foot here, trying to figure out, here we go. You are, you're good there. So you can see this angle. Maybe. Yep. Yeah. So this is where the built in break over for the boot is on the case of a glove. So if the glove fits well, the tip of the foot is going to be here roughly. And so then when the horse moves and breaks over, you're not going to affect the break over too much. You can also add more break over to most boots if you want to. Um, but say that you add a front shim, that's going to move the toe from where it should be back further and all of a sudden the break over is too far back. Now long toes and break over I could go on a very long rant about um, but let's just be short and sweet in that if you would like to have a soft tissue injury um, feel free to let your break over be too long and your toes be too long but if you would like to have a sound horse I highly recommend keeping your toes really short and your break over short. Um, you can also think of it if you want a personal feeling of it. Um, if you look at your own fingernails and you see, okay, now if you took just the nail, not your whole fingertip, but just the nail and tried to open a soda can with just the nail, that feeling is not comfortable. Kind of the same thought when you've got wall that is too long, that is pulling on the lamina like that. It's not comfortable. Um, very often I'll walk up to a horse who's overgrown, whack off a bunch of, of extra flared wall and they go and they walk off sound and do nothing else. Long toes especially are very uncomfortable and cause soundness problems. And this is why I'm very hesitant ever to do toe shims in a boot. Um, mm -hmm. Scoot boots, a fish, uh, shim that they make is a toe shim and I don't even carry them because I just don't like using them. If I need to do a toe shim for some reason, then I'll make it with tape but I, I don't put toe shims in because extending breakover is a huge problem, especially in, in sport horses. Um, soapbox over. <laughs> um, so for renegades, random, but if your renegades are tight, fastened too tightly, they often will twist. Oh. So if they are the correct fit and everything fits nicely, but you're, you're getting off and going, why are they twisting just a little bit? They need space for that heel mechanism, the cable mechanism for the heel captivator to give and take a little bit as the boot moves. So what will happen is if they're too tight, the whole boot will shift, but it can't shift back and recenter itself. Mm. So you have to have a teeny bit of give in that captivator cable so that the boot can do its shift and shift back. 
I have magically fixed a good number of renegades this way. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, it's not something people think of it having to loosen. Just, just like an eighth of an, it, it's the teeniest amount. So if you are cranking down your renegades, just snug, but don't crank. And your problems may disappear. So fit changes over cycle. Uh, so like we said, some boots accommodate changes better than others. Uh, if you need a performance boot that will accommodate changes, then a scoot boot's really your only choice. Um, Renegade can sometimes accommodate changes depending which direction they are. Uh, a short trim cycle is important with boots. You can't let your horse go as long and then you go, oh, they need a trim, I'll call my farrier and he'll be here in two weeks. No, you need a, a regular cycle or you need to be able to do the maintenance work yourself or both, frankly. Um, typically the problem ends up just being excess wall length and chips. Um, you know, the chipping can catch on the edges of the boot when you go to put the boot on. Uh, so learning to roll the walls yourself, again, it's not hard. It's a great skill to have. Um, you know, I, I, every client that I have taught, even if they don't do it often, they say, hey, I'm so glad you showed me that because you blew a huge chip three days before you were going to come. And I, I had a big trail ride planned and I couldn't get the boot on. And so I wrapped the chip back and the boot went on and we had a great ride. Nice. Yeah. You know? So it's, it's a skill that is really useful to have and I recommend everybody learn. Uh, drainage questions. Um, so many boots have good to excellent drainage. Uh, scoop boots, Cavallos, Renegades. Um, Cavallos have, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, that little hole yeah. right there on the sides. Yeah, so they've got one, of the, uh, one drainage hole on each side. Okay. Um, scoot boots, obviously. Lots of damage. <laughs> I can stick my fingers in them all over the place. Uh, when I actually do show and tell, I'll turn off the background so that doesn't keep doing that. Um, some are intended to fit really snugly so that you just don't get very much water or debris in them. Um, so gloves, for example. So adding drain holes, though, is really easy with a power drill. Um, shouldn't affect the use of your boot. Will void your warranty. Um, about a half inch is a good size. You won't get too much debris coming in, but your water and any you know little bits of sand should be able to get out. But obviously, if you do put drainage holes in, you will have more sand in the boot. Um, so, you know, I usually recommend try them several times in the kind of terrain that you're worried about first and see if you actually need to do it. So some boot specific tips. Um, so again, twisting renegades, loosen the straps. Uh, you can, if you've got a horse with a weird foot, um, very often this will happen if you've got really pointy heel bulbs or if you have like a, like a draft cross with huge heel bulbs, something like that. You can combine different size and styles of renegade shells and captivators. So the Viper and Classic renegade um, shells, so the part that actually goes on the hoof, uh, are different shapes and the captivators that go over the heels are different shapes. So depending if you're having a fit problem or you're just not sure or you know your horse's weird feet, um, just reach out to them with pictures and stuff and they will help you combine um, different bits and pieces to get the right fit. You can also change out the Velcro straps that are foxtail traps um, for biothane or leather dog collars. Um, that's a really good one because that can be really unpleasant. <laughs> yes, sitting there, you're out camping, you had a wonderful ride, and you get to spend all evening with tweezers pulling foxtails out of the Velcro. It's delightful. Um, very easy to fix. Just take off the Velcro and put on the straps instead. Um, for easy boot gloves that work like 90% of the time, but you have those occasional moments where you're like, where did my boot go? Um, power straps. Um, a good hack on these, if you've got a foot that you need to use a power strap, but the power strap makes it too hard for you to get on, is you can use scoop boot front straps or at least their little knob hardware, um, which... So is a power to... strap specific to that boot? What's a power yes. strap? So yeah, so the power strap is what Easy Care calls it and they sell them that way. Okay. Um, so the little knob mechanism I'm talking about is being able to just put these on and off after they're on the foot, which is actually easier than when they're not on the foot at all. <laughs> there we go. Um, versus having to have the power strap be fastened with a screw on both sides all the time. 
which is how they're designed. Um, so depending on your need for a power strap, um, the other thing with power straps, they are marked on where to punch your holes for sizes. Very often that's really tight, like too tight, way too tight. Um, so very, you know, so you can play with how tight you actually think you need them to be. If your boot works really well, except for certain circumstances, you probably don't need them as tight as the, they're marked. Um, so, you know, again, figuring, doing a little DIY is necessary with boots unless you can find someone who knows all the tricks already. Right. Um, but anyway, you can use scoop boot front straps instead of easy care power straps, or you can use little knob type hardware that scoop boot does um, on your power straps so that you can just snap them shut once they're already on the foot. Um, I have a picture later of what the power straps do, but they hold, so they fasten on either side of the V in front. Okay. So when the V, so a well-fitting glove when it's on the foot stretches open like this. Okay. But if you, if the, the foot is not quite large enough to pull this open, the power strap snugs it down so it can only open so far. Oh, okay, okay. So say you're scrambling up rocks. If the boot would stay on for flat work, but when you go char riding, it likes to twist or pop or, or shift, then putting on the power strap will keep it from opening this far, say, when you're going through that terrain and the boot, and the, and, and the boot coming off, and it'll just let it stretch a little bit, but it won't hold, it won't let it open all the way. So they just restrain that top area. And I've got a picture of it later. Um, as we mentioned, the athletic tape works really well for, for gloves um, and heat fitting. Um, I actually have a whole slide on glove mods. So we'll, we'll get into that. Um, if your scoot boot front straps are too tight, you know, no, don't think about changing sizes. If the boot fits otherwise, use a pair of pliers or a hoof pick to get them closed. Also, if they're new and they're tight, they will stretch. Also, if they're brand new and you can't get them fastened, they're slippery from the factory. So just patience for a few rides in the dust will take, take care of their problem for you. Um, mild quarter flares, scoot boots are, scoot will, I don't think there's, they'll ever say that flare, quarter flares are great for scoots, except your quarter flare sticks out right here and the boot will never turn and never come off. <laughs> so if I have a foot with quarter flares that I can put in a scoot, I put them in a scoot by default because I know that that owner will be very happy with the performance. Now, mild quarter flares, not huge massive quarter flares, but mild quarter flares. And it's a better idea to just fix the quarter flare, but um, so boot specific tips. Um, this is where your mole foam and duct tape come in handy. Um, and I tried to get my own photo of this and it did not come out nearly as well because my duct tape was not blue. So I used Karen's. Thank you, Karen. She's over at Timberline Tack. Uh, very, very knowledgeable scoop food dealer. Um, so these are the DIY gaiters. You put your, you could cut your little pieces of foam, wrap them around the heel bulb straps or the uh, side vents, which you can kind of see down by her fingers there. Um, and then you wrap them in duct tape so that they stay on. So if you have a weird spot that the gator doesn't cover that you need uh, protected, if you know you you wear out your gaiters really quickly, and you want to do this instead, uh, if your horse like mine has a neoprene allergy, oh, um, yeah, fun. Can't use anything synthetic on her. It's great. Um, then this works very well for doing your scoop boot gaiters and uh, shims and that kind of thing. So easy boot glove modifications in particular. Um, so gloves, let me just preface this. He's down, this link's down at the bottom, but Pete Ramey is the master of glove modifications. Um, all ideas are from him pretty much. <laughs> um, so do go to his website and read, well, read all his articles because they're wonderful. But uh, specifically there's one, I think it's at the top right now, actually that's modifications of gloves and glue on shells. Um, so what can't you do with gloves? You can heat fit, you can toe slot, you can grind off your break over, you can change it if you've got a horse who moves funny. Uh, you can add buckles, you can do the power straps, which are those blue straps there. Mm -hmm. um, and those power straps have been done with the scoot boot knobs so that you can take them off, put the boot on, put them back on. 
um, you can modify your traction. So if you've got, uh, you know, a horse who goes a lot on grass and you need more concavity so that they can get better grip, that's uh, that picture there with the two boots side by side, you can see the one's been ground out and that one on the uh, right hand side of that picture is a stock boot. Um, you can wedge them by grinding down the front. You can rocker them, give yourself a, a, a better heel landing for a horse that likes to land really hard on the heels and you want to soften that landing. Uh, it, there's so much you can do with gloves. Um, so they are a fantastic boot. They're honestly my favorite boot for all of these options that they can give you. But obviously there's quite a bit of DIY that goes on here. Um, and everything voids your warranty. <laughs> but that's usually not what most people are worried about. Um, so that first top photo, you can see how bulged out that toe is. That horse um, had quite a bit of toe flare. So that was after I rasped back as much toe flare as I was comfortable doing. So you can see here's the default. Yeah. And you can compare it to that photo with how much you're able to heat up and move that toe. And I could have easily gone further. I just got the heel to where I was okay with it. Um, and those went on gluons. You can do a boot that way. Um, so I could have done that and then popped, I probably would have done a little bit more to get the heel a little further back for better gator um, attachment and then popped a gator on it and you could have had a boot like that. Um, that's a great option for um, horses who are you know, in turnout or starting some, some light exercise. A horse with this much rotation and flaring, you're probably not going to be working very hard um, because those lamina are very damaged. So, you know, in this case for this horse, you know, no boots fit him, obviously. Um, so we ended up, and he was so underrun that casting was just not working for him. He was, he was pulling the casts and turnout. So we ended up doing the, um, the glue ones for him. Uh, and that worked pretty well. And he's now grown out three quarters of that toe flare and he's in scoots and he's a happy guy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that kind of stuff does grow out and his feet are much more normal now. But um, in the beginning, that's that's what we had to do. Um, and I've done several horses, you know, whenever I do glove glue-ons, I usually heat fit because that's going to give me the best fit and not these great big gaps where I have to sh show full of glue, um, which never works as well as you think it's going to. Um, toe slotting is another really, really awesome one. Um, I do that with a Dremel with a particular bit, which I forget which one it is, but it's listed in Pete's article. Um, and so that is tremendously helpful for hind feet because the toe of the hind foot being more spade shaped, it actually will peek out of that toe slot a little bit. So if your problem is that your gloves are twisting and you're going up hills, if the toe is literally sticking out of the boot, I promise you they're not going to twist anymore. <laughs> well, that so makes that, sense too. Yeah, that works really well. Um, they're great for hind boots. So that one photo I showed you earlier of the horse in all four gloves, he's in standard stock gloves in front and they're toe slotted behind. And he does, he's, he goes all over in those and he is great. Um, that's the traction modification you can see there in that photo, basically just drumming out the inside half. Um, that boot's also been rockered a little bit in the heel so you can see how the, the heel's been rasped a little bit and also increase the flexibility through the heel by increasing um, the, uh, there's a little bit of a divot to mimic the, the frog in the heel area of the boot, yeah. but you can increase that to add more flexibility. Okay. So many options. Um, so Boots, um, using gloves as boots or glue ones is a great, great option for us professionals who encounter really weird feet all the time. Um, but this is definitely something that can be a little daunting and a little expensive while you practice um, for the average owner. I totally understand that. So if you're feeling like this is like, uh, no, thank you. Totally no problem with that. But if you have a horse who you just cannot figure it out with, um, you know, this article, will he's, he discusses all this kind of stuff. Um, and the gloves are really, really awesome for their flexibility to adapt. 
So again, just a little slide showing a handful of uh, different models. Um, those bottom two rows are all easy care models, and that's not even all of them. So um, it, it, just an idea to how many boots there are on the market. So do not feel like because the first three boots you tried didn't work, that there is not a boot for you. Um, you know, finding someone who is experienced with all of your boots, especially someone who's local, um, but, you know, someone who can even make suggestions for you saying, hey, you know, this boot really works. I know that the company doesn't say so, but this boot actually works really well for your situation. Um, the best way to avoid all of the problems is to get a boot that fits well in the first place. Or actually to have someone trim your foot so that it's not distorted so that you get a boot that fits the first one. Yes. Well, yeah. but keep in mind as well that trimming the foot to the boot is not the way to go. No, but trimming the foot to health. Yes. To health yes. Getting the foot healthy so that you can get a normal foot into a normal boot is, is obviously our end goal. But right. um, sometimes that's just not possible. Right. And so we have choices in the meantime. Okay, so again, you know, a little bit on, on how I can help you. I'm happy to work remotely. Um, obviously, if you're in the Southern California area, San Diego, Riverside counties, I may be able to come and help you, but um, you can find me online. Um, I'm always down to chat about boots and horses and feet, um, kind of an obsession, which is sort of why I have this job. Um, so you do you do like phone consults with videos and photos? Yeah, no, I'll happily do, you know, photos and that kind of thing. Um, you know, make, make suggestions. It's it's tricky to fit boots off of measurements alone. Right. Um, so sometimes what we end up doing is like, we'll ship you two pairs and you figure out which one works better and send the other one back. Um, or we might say, okay, well now that we've narrowed it down to models that are gonna work for you, try and find somebody local in your area to come and do a fitting with fit okay. kits. So someone's um, asking if you're familiar with fusions or flex boots. Fusions, I am a dealer for equine fusion um flex boots i have not i have a client in them but i haven't really had much use with them the problem here is that uh, in san diego we're a desert we have rock for trails and they just wear out really fast really really fast all the folks at local that i know have tried them have said they just wear out too fast to be feasible um, and they've gone back to gloves or scoots or something like that um fusions um my favorite model is the active um, I am having quite a bit of trouble with the trekking, which I love the design. I love the fit, but it collects sand like nobody's business and then they come off. So I've had two or three clients all have the same problem, which is really, really frustrating because they're a really nice boot. Um, but the active does not have that problem. I have horses in, you know, in turnout for, I mean, they've been going 20 hours a day turnout for six months in a pair of actives and going great in them with cloud uh, pads inside. Um, I love, love the equine fusion soles. Um, they're great for horses who are sensitive, uh, rehabbing, thin soled, um, because they're thick enough and durable enough, but also flexible enough and they take the concussion. Um, so I really do like the equine fusion active for that. The recovery is great for distorted feet, but it's not a riding boot. Um, so I have a few things here we can take a look at. Sure. Quick, you know, thank you to everyone who gave me pictures to use. Um, okay, so let's pop back from screen sharing. Yeah, here. Up at the top. There, there we go. go. Okay. Um, turn off my background. Doo -doo. Okay, so. Um, the scoot boot endurance gator, um, which I use in many different boots. So it's not just for scoot. So you've got the strap that goes around the pastern and Velcros, and then you've got the base, which goes into the boot and they stand on. Oh, okay. Um, so in a scoot boot, stay because of course it's a new one so it's not already broken in um so that's how you get protection with it with the scoop boot um is it's going to cover 
when you put your strap on, it's going to cover yep. the entire pasture area, which is great. So these are really, really nice when you have a horse who gets pasture and ropes up here. The issue with padding of any time is when you get a boot that is already a little bit snug. Mm -hmm. Adding more padding does not fix it. So if you have, and again, logical conclusion, if you're wearing your own shoes and hey, they're a little bit tight, are you gonna put thicker socks on? No. Which no, is we're gonna put thinner socks on, but if we can't do that with a horse, then you're gonna yeah. find something that fits better. Yeah. Um, so, but this is, you know, good if you have a horse who, you know, is in between sizes and he's fine the last couple of weeks of your cycle, but the first week of a trim, the boot's a little too big and it, and it moves around too much or whatever. Um, okay, then pop your gator in, have a nice ride, and then the rest of your time, you know, you don't need to worry about it. Um, for scoot boots specifically, mud straps are also handy for that. Um, but here's another example of you know, the, the Easy Care Fury is actually a similar design to scoots in certain ways. Um, but here is how that gator works in the Fury. So again, you can see how it covers up those heel bulb areas where you might get rubs. And of course, all the boots are all black and this is not making it easier to see. But, and then here is that gator in a Cavallo. So it's very handy. Yes, this design works great for a lot of uses. So that gator design works in it's not going to work in a glove, as you can tell, because you're just look, looking at the same area. But any design where, you know, with Cavallos, I very often will get rubs right here. Right, yeah. On that collar for a horse who's low heeled. Yep. Um, if your horse is low heeled, Cavallos are a problem. If your horse is too high heeled, Cavallos can be a problem because they will run into this little mm -hmm. stiff spot right here. Um, but we often can make them work. If they're too low, you put a each bit of a wedge in there. Um, if they're too high, well, hopefully you're working on that anyway. But um, the this gator design works very well for many boot models. So I do like these gators. Um, I'm very glad that um, Scoot is, is, is making a design like this. Um, so that gator is a really helpful tool if you have issues. Um, tube socks, again, like I mentioned, put your sock over the leg tape down at the bottom so it doesn't slide up. Um, so one of my other tricks, and I was trying to figure out if I had time to get this photographed for this webinar and I just could not make it happen. Um, and this works really well with gloves. So hopefully I can figure out a way to show you without actual, ah, I do have tape, hang on one second, let me grab it. It's not even black. AT tape, everyone, your farrier's favorite tool for keeping themselves able to turn your horse. Okay, so this is, you know, I, I do this with duct tape um, because, and I've tried it with elastic I've tried it with athletic tape. It works best with duct tape. And I think because the duct tape is slippery and smooth. Um, so pretend this is your horse's foot, not a boot, but you know, shape is correct and the same. Um, so if you're getting a rub area, on the heel bulb. So in this case, it would be right kind of at the points of the heel bulb here. And I, I do find that this happens some with gloves, you know, on a horse who's a little underrun or something like that. It's often when I'll use this, or if you're going to be putting a lot of miles on, you know, if you're going camping for the weekend and all of a sudden you're tripling your mileage mm -hmm. in, you know, like you're doing way longer rides three or four days in a row, you know, chances are you're going to have a little bit of rub. Um, if you've done it before and you know that it's not catastrophic, it's just the hair off and your horse doesn't, isn't bothered by it, then you may not have to worry about it. But if you've got a, a horse with really sensitive skin or, you know, um, I had to do with someone of mine not too long ago, he'd blown an abscess out the heel bulb. So he had a really tender spot without any hair on it anyway. Um, things like that. This is a really nice little thing you can do, which is easy, set it and forget it kind of situation. Um, if you do it before you have a problem, then it's obviously a little simpler. Um, but if you do it when you've just gotten the hair off, but no further 
Um, you know, so what we're basically going to do is we're going to cover with our duct tape the heel ball barrier. So, of course, you've got tape on hair, which right. is always a question. Now, note we're not wrapping all the way around because you do not want something that is not stretchy banding the foot banding the foot and causing damage okay it's one piece and you can and, and you could if you needed to come all the way to the front here and do you know something like that wait hold it up higher gotta have there we gap. go gotta have a gap um easiest way to make your horse sore is something like duct tape because it doesn't stretch it doesn't breathe if it, if it wraps all the way around so this is when uh in that little boot first aid kit uh your baby powder comes in handy a um, little bit of ointment if you need it. If you abs, if the, the rub got really bad on you, uh, this is when your cotton or your gauze will work. So, um, if you have a, if you have irritated skin or a little oozing or something like that, um, then you can do a little bit of ointment, and then put like one or, like one or two layers of gauze, not like a big fat thing of it, but just a little bit over your sore, um, or a little. You know, half a cotton ball, something like that, just to keep, because you don't want your tape to stick on a, a wound area, obviously. Right. Then over the hair area, so that the tape does not stick heavily to the hair. We want it to stick a little bit, but not a lot. I do a little bit, a little bit, a little baby powder. Okay. Um, if I'm on the side of the trail, I have been known to use a little very fine dirt if you absolutely have to. Because sometimes you're, you know, out for six hours and you take your boots off to check them in the middle of the day and you go, oh crap, you know, but you have duct tape in your saddlebag. Um, and then, you know, so powder the heels, dust off the excess. You want just a little bit of powder because you need some sticking, but not too much sticking. Make sure that your hoof wall where you're going to anchor your tape is pretty solid and clean enough that it'll anchor well and carefully, you're not going to tighten it and pull it over. You're just going to lay it over and anchor it on both sides on the hoof wall and cover like that. And you're going to leave it there until it starts falling off. Don't rip it off later. You know, yeah. that's going to obviously pull hair out and damage things and whatever. So if you, you know, you, you, you do this wrap and basically what we're trying to do is provide just enough so that the boot will slide on the duct tape right. instead of rub. And yeah, so this works for friction. So if you know that your horse can be prone to having a little bit of rubbing going on and you're going to do a longer ride, then put some duct tape on before you go. You know, if you're on a three-day weekend, if you do it, you, you, you may be able to do it the first day and not have to do, and just take it off at the end. Um, and you do have to put your boot on carefully over it because if you yeah, just shove it on, it'll pull the tape. It'll pull it up. Yeah, okay. Um, so if you, you do it to kind of carefully get your boot on over it. But it does work well. Um, I use it many times myself. Like I said, you know, on the side of a trail, you check your boots and go, oh, this is going to be a bloody mess if I wait until I get home. Right. And again, this is not a substitute for boots that do not fit, but it's a, you know, either it's prevention, if you know you get a teeny problem, or if you're building a bigger problem, but you need to get home so you can change out your boots or whatever, um, it's a, it'll do in a pinch. Right. Um, so I've, I've tried it with other materials. I think duct tape still works the best. Um, if you've got really good duct tape, like Gorilla Tape, that really works awesome. Um, okay. The cheap duct tape tends to kind of come apart, okay. um, but you just do it more often, that's fine. So the trick there though, definitely is use a little bit of powder over the hairline area so that the tape only half sticks. Ah, uh, okay. Because obviously then you have to, it, it, it pulls and the horses don't like it. It's uncomfortable. They're like, well, why are you taping directly to my hair? This is not comfortable. Um, but if you put enough powder that it sticks, but it, it doesn't really adhere super tight, then I have found that that works actually really well. Um, so again, you're just gonna anchor the tape to the wall wrap it gently around the heel bulbs that you need to protect and anchor it to the other wall. So it's just going to be over the hairline of the bulbs and you're going to use the powder to protect everything that you don't need it to adhere strictly to. Awesome. And if you have a little bit of damaged skin going on, then 
put a little teeny bit of ointment on there so it doesn't stick at all to your damaged area. Um, if you have any oozing or bleeding going on, which please, hopefully you caught this and you don't, you won't, but that's when a little bit of a couple, couple layers of gauze or half a cotton ball or something just to really protect that area is good. So it sounds like if it's wet, keep it moist. If it's dry, keep it dry with a little Usually bit. Speaking, yeah. yeah. Basically, you know, how I like to think of it is, you know, I don't want to put duct tape on a wound. Right. Without protecting it. Yes. So we're just putting just enough to just protect it from the tape. Yep. Um, so a little bit of ointment so the tape doesn't stick there. Great. Um, if you do that, though, make sure that the tape is sticking well around it so it doesn't slip yeah. up and then undo what you're trying to do in the first place. Right. Right. Awesome. Well, this has been fascinating, Sarah. It's uh, um, it, 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 I, I feel a lot more comfortable this time listening to you. The first time it was like so overwhelming. <laughs> that, that first webinar was, there is so much to go over and it's just doing it in, you know, an yeah. hour or even less yeah. is just. Exactly. Um, but I, this time around, I feel a little better and I'll probably be sending you some photos because my horse, I'm, I'm going to go to the boot route, but right now I'm not home and he's out in the field. So it yeah. hasn't been a problem. Um, but I don't know that I have any boot fitters in my area, so I may be sending you some pictures. You know, it's interesting. A number of trimmers, while they don't necessarily advertise themselves as fitters, you know, um, a lot of folks are easy care dealers um, and they use, because they do gluons and stuff through easy care, but they don't necessarily sell the products per se, but they might have a fit kit. Oh, okay. So it's worth yeah. checking in my neighborhood. Yeah, so definitely worth asking around and, you know, or I mean, how I got started was I had a bin full of like seven pairs of boots that had just been rejects on my own horses. And a friend would be like, hey, I'm trying to figure out what to get. I'm like, okay, well, I'll come out there and just start putting boots on until you find something. Unfortunately, there is some aspect of that. I mean, it's like buying your own shoes. Oh, yeah. You know, you go to Zappos and you're like, well, I'm a nine and a half in this. And then in, in this brand, I'm a 10, but in this brand, I actually need a nine wide. And it's just, and, and this brand doesn't fit me at all. Right. You know, it's every manufacturer, you know, and, and, and sizing is, folks will ask me, oh, well, he, you know, I asked, what size do you think you need? Have you done measurements? You know, oh, well, I need a size one. I'm like, yeah, you know, more information. Yeah, he's a size one in Cavallo's. Okay, so that means you're probably a one and a half or a two in a glove, maybe a three slim, possibly in a, it, it, it just, there's, Why there's you can't almost no correlation. Sizing system for everything, I don't know, but it doesn't mm -hmm. seem to be possible at this point. The one sizing <laughs> system that I really like, because it just is logical, is that Equine Fusion, I believe it's, I think it's width, maybe it's length, one or the other. Size 15 is 150 millimeters. Size 14 is 140. <laughs> so obviously when you get into the slims and the not slims and all of that, but you can get a general guess. When someone tells me they're size 16 equine fusion, I know I got a big old foot I'm working with. Yeah. You know? Now, of course, on the flip side, you've got soft ride whose sizes are backwards. Small numbers are big feet, I think. So it's just uh, confusing. You, know, you need size charts. You need size charts. And that will only even tell you, okay, here's your ballpark two or three sizes. You need to try them all on. Right. Um, so boot fitting from a distance is, is tough. And it's something that takes a lot of practice. Um, you know, if you're really interested in scoop so, boots so and you're doing. Anna's asking if there's any standardization. Oh, the no, not at all. Not at all. Nope. Not at all. Sometimes within one company, they might have some, um, but I suspect that's mostly because they use the same molds to create the boots more so than out of intention. Um, yeah, so fit kits are really great. You know, I, I mentioned in that one picture of the, uh, the scoop boots, um, you know, with uh, the homemade gators, um, that was from Karen Cox over at Timberline Tack. And a, a, frankly, I don't even try just to fit my own scoot boots remotely. I just send them to her because she has a great, great way that she's set up to do it. 
um, she'll actually send you multiple pairs of boots to fit. Oh, wow. Yeah. And you can try them and you can a little bit and, and actually, yeah. So she's had a really great system. So, you know, definitely recommend working with her. Um, if you are not able to work with someone local and you need to do uh, scoop boots remotely. Great. Well, Sarah, I want to thank you so much. Again, this has been really informative. It's great to see you again. And thank you for coming back. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, it's always fun. Yep. And so everybody just remember, you can find this in all the webinars on the Surefoot Ecoin YouTube channel. Tomorrow we have Sarah Schlote coming back for Equisoma part two. If you have not watched part one, which was pre-recorded and put up on the YouTube channel, please go and watch that because we're gonna pick up from there and keep on going. Her work is fascinating and it's really applicable to working with your horse and making him feel safe. So thank you, Sarah, so much. For, it's great to see you. I really appreciate it. Right. Have a great day. Bye. You too, everyone.